Yeah, okay. Yeah, I noticed that. I didn't do that. <coughs> I think we'll go ahead and, and get started. Uh, I, uh, I watched what we did last week because I had people tell me I spoke too fast. And uh, so I'm going to try to slow, slow down tonight. Uh, I have to tell you this little thing that happened to me. Um, because of Ukraine, I wrote a little song because I wanted to do something. And uh, so I wrote a song to the old Beatles song, Let It Be. And so I wrote it and I got a, went and got on Facebook to, um, what's the guy's name? I forgot his name all. It's uh, not, huh? Jesse Waters. We've got a news guy on Fox. I said, if you want a song about the Ukraine, you know, look at Rick Roy, uh, keep them free, you know, on, on uh, YouTube. And so I did that, and I went back to my YouTube site, and above my YouTube site, there were two things that said, we have Rick Roy's phone number and his address. <laughs> and yeah, that's what it said, and, and it had a, over here on the side where you can click on something, they had what we did last Friday night on there. <laughs> so I'm going, okay. But anyway, um, let's have prayer and we'll, we'll start here. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for everything you do for us. And we thank you for the Sabbath that's coming. And we ask that you send your spirit here tonight and uh, help us to uh, be drawn closer to you and help us to understand how close we are to this whole thing wrapping up. Bless us all and keep us safe later on this evening when we go home. In your name we ask it, amen. Uh, like I told you last time, we're not trying to set a date for the coming of Christ. That's not what we're attempting to do. And uh, we also are, um, uh, we, we took the information that we have and we took it to the education, uh, the education president of the uh, Arizona Conference and sat down with him so that he would know and we got authorization to preach in the churches. And then we, when we got here, we went to Pastor Wayne and uh, sat down and presented what we had also. Uh, and that's kind of the way Ellen White wants it done so that we don't get air, okay? And uh, that doesn't mean that the president of the conference agreed with everything, nor did Wayne agree with everything, okay? That just meant that, that they had, they'd heard it, they said it was fine to preach from the pulpit and whatever. So uh, anyway, just so that you know all that, I thought I'd start uh, with a review a little bit of what we did last week. And let me turn this thing on. Um, the righteous will be informed about when Christ is about to return. We're not going to know the day or hour. Uh, I don't know if we'll know the month or year, but we definitely aren't going to know the day or hour. The wicked is going to be a total surprise. It's going to be a thief of the night type of thing, as so many of those texts said. We are to watch, we're to be alert, we're not to fall asleep, we're not trying to delay until the last trolley out. The idea is that you get acquainted with Christ as soon as we can and, and develop that relationship and uh, uh, just be you know, followers of his, right? Like we are now. We are at the end of every major vision Okay, so every, we went through a lot of them last time. And we are at the end of every last one of them. So this should tell us that we're coming in to the end of the whole thing. We have, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, we've been preaching for 156 years that the second coming is soon and that it's near. Uh, we actually have gone past when Isaiah told the Israelites that they would be taken captive if they don't straighten up. Uh, that vision was, I mean, that prophecy was 150 years before it took place. And we've gone past that by about six years. Our only unique doctrine, which is the, uh, the pre-advent judgment, uh, refers to the week of time in it. So uh, a lot of our, our forefathers uh, believed, our pioneers believed in the week of time. And it's fascinating, at least to me, that it is there. And by the way, if you have any questions, please, you know, raise your hands. This is not supposed to be a lecture, okay? Um, I wanted to mention something that I didn't mention about this. 
that is that 1844, a lot of, we have folks in the church that don't believe in, in 1844, okay? They don't believe in, in any of the, um, uh, the uh, three angels' messages, any of that stuff. And, and just look at the events that transpired in less than 90 years, 89 years, about every 12 years, something's going on. And you could sit down and you could go, where are we? We're right here. Okay. One of the things I used to do to my Bible teachers, I think maybe I told you last time, uh, in seventh and eighth grade, uh, they would go through this and I would go, where are we? Well, they couldn't tell you, you know. And, oh, well, the Sunday laws, you know, and the, you know, but they could not tell you. Here, they could tell you. Why? Because the longest prophecy in the Bible is about to hit. Okay? And it was one thing after another thing after another thing after another thing so that that came to the attention of, every, of everyone. And I don't know if you thought about it or not, but if they'd have gotten it right, the message wouldn't have gone worldwide. It just wouldn't have. Uh, well, the judgment started. Oh, really? Where is it? Up there. Oh, good. <laughs> right. You know, because you're crazy and you can't prove it. See? But because they get it wrong and it's impacting everybody's lives, if the Lord's coming back, this thing goes out throughout, and they're playing on every one of those events to show that it's, that it's coming, you know. So it's kind of a good thing, maybe, that it, they didn't get it right. It went everywhere. Okay, I wanted to also look at this thing. Uh, people's eyes were starting to kind of get tired, and I was tired, and, and I didn't know if anybody got any of this. So I got thinking about maybe a different way to just present it so that you could see how this is really interesting. Because remember, the response to the day of the Lord is, is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day, is because you had scoffers saying, where's it coming? And when do those scoffers come? Now, it says in the final days, in the last days, okay? So, what did they forget? This is why I decided to look at it so we could follow the text through easier. That What on earth did they forget? And they purposely forgot this. And because they purposely forgot, they're saying, where's this second coming thing you're talking about? So you have the creation, the flood, and the final judgment. They purposely forget. So here's an idea. Why don't we take what we're told not to forget and apply it to what they forgot? Okay? And as that might seem to be some way that we're responding back to the scoffers and actually they're giving them something. What are we supposed to remember? All right, we said it enough times last time. A day of the Lord is a thousand years, <clears throat> and a thousand years is a day. So let's, let's try it. The creation took place in seven days. Then things were very good. Okay, that's what we know about the creation. So let's apply the, the thing we're supposed to remember is seven days then would equal 7,000 years because a day to the Lord is a thousand years. All right? Okay, so that's about all we know from the first thing. We have a 7,000-year date. We don't know what it's for. We don't know too much about anything. So let's look at the next thing. The flood. Well, interestingly enough, Noah preaches for 120 years, and the Lord doesn't let him preach clear up until the day before it starts raining. In fact, the Lord doesn't let him. He'd have gotten a lot more people if the clouds would have been going, a little thunder, lightning, you know, and Noah's still out there going, hey, right? But, but that doesn't happen. When they go into the boat seven days before the flood. So let's apply our thing again. It's 7,000 years. It ties up to the, the creation one they forgot. But now we know more. What happens after the seven days? It begins to rain, and the righteous are saved, and the wicked are lost. So now we have something. We've got 7,000 years, and the righteous are going to be saved, and the wicked are going to be lost, according to what that says. How right? do we know that the seven days for creation wasn't 7,000 years? Well, I, I'm glad you asked that question. I will tell you, I didn't mention that last time either. The reason why the SDA Bible commentary says that all of this doesn't mean anything is because we had people who were taking that and applying it to creation and saying it wasn't seven days, it was 7,000 years. So that's why the SDA Bible Commentary doesn't go down that road. 
and allow you to use this as any kind of a measure. Yes, sir. What's that? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And the the other answer to your question is every time it says that evening in the morning, is the first day. Okay. So that's that's the clue on that one. Okay. All right. So then the righteous righteous are going to be saved and the wicked are going to be lost. That's what we know now about looking at that. And there's seven thousand years involved. All right. So this is not. You can't apply it to the flood. Because the flood is about 1,600 years after the creation or the fall, right? So that doesn't apply to them. So this is symbolic of something, right? So let's take the next one, which is the final judgment, the earth being destroyed by fire. And what do we know about that? Look at that. It ties up to the previous one. It says the righteous will be saved and sin and sinners will be destroyed. Okay, so it's tying you back up to Noah, and Noah's ties you back up to the creation, right? So you have 7,000, 7,000. Then you have the righteous for Satan, the wicked were lost twice. All right? So it will be 7,000 years, seven days for the Lord, from the creation slash fall to the end of sin and rebellion. Now, if we say that, and this is at the end of the time when the scoffers show up, I can go to Revelation, and most every religion going knows that there's a thousand years. Some people think the thousand years is uh, before Christ comes. Some think people think it's afterward. But that thousand years is the last thousand years, okay? And so I, I take a thousand years, and I subtract it from the seven. I've got 6,000 years the way we believe that the Lord shows up. Now you have an answer to the scoffers. When's this coming? There it is. It's played laid right out for him. Clear as bell. See what I'm saying? There are questions on that? Okay. So because we went over this, I just wasn't sure people were grabbing everything on it. All right. So in essence, God has a plan. Okay. And he planned all this stuff out. And that's another response to them is that he has it all figured out. God is patient and wants all men to be saved. Now, if you use that for an argument, like the SDA Bible Commentary said, that's a crazy argument to scoffers because they don't believe in God in the first place. Okay? Who is the group that are scoffers today that don't believe in a creation and think everything has gone on just the way it always has? Who is it? Evolutionists. They start with the premise, there is no God. That's, that's, that's where they go. Okay. So, yeah. If it says this is the year 2200, and you have 7,000, and you minus 2200, then you have like 5,000 years left. Well, if you, yeah, if you start that way, yeah. All right, now, so God knows the day and hour of the second coming. The amount of time that is necessary for man to choose to be saved or not is already planned in there. Like we talked before, the Lord's not going, well, look at there. You know, they did all these nice things. I got to change this time I set up. Go ahead. Wait, didn't, didn't Sister White say that <coughs> that, that you, They could have come air along this. Yes. The 1888 message doesn't, doesn't go out. The general conference boys didn't do. They didn't accept it initially. They sent her to Australia to get her out so she wouldn't be bothering them with it. And, yeah, she says that. Do you think the Lord knew that? He knows, right? He, now, Peter says, you know, that you can speed his coming, you know, so that you will speed his coming. Well, if we do something that's going to speed his coming, the Lord still knows the day or hour, right? He's not sitting there checking it out, hoping that, you know, everybody stays with him on that. See, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Makes sense? Okay. The event is going to be planned at a particular time that God the Father knows. And we know that because it says only he knows the day or hour. God has a plan, and the skeptics are not going to get that plan unless they stop purposely forgetting things. And remember this for us, but you brothers are not in darkness, so that day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. So what should we do since we know all these things so far? It says, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to be live holy and godly lives. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, 
<clears throat> make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. So you also must be ready. Revelation, remember therefore what you have received and heard, obey and repent. So in essence, like I said earlier, we're not doing this so we can catch the last trolley out. That's not what we're doing this for. Uh, it might help motivate us a little bit so that we realize that we're running out of time and our kids and our family and our people we know and people at work. What would you do if you knew it was going to happen soon? Would you be happy with just going on about our business like we do? Blessed is he who stays awake. Be on your guard. Be alert. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. A couple watch texts and then we'll be on to the next section. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know what day your Lord will come. Even so, when you see all these things, and we went through all those things last time, know that it is near, right at the door. Okay, scriptural support for the week of time. We're going to go through kind of ideas of, of what people use. It won't be everything, uh, because there's a lot of them, but this will give you some of it. Leviticus 25, 1 to 5 says that the Israelites were to work the ground for six years and then the ground was to lay fallow the seventh year. And we showed you last time if a day represents a year and a day represents a thousand years, then a year represents a year, a thousand years, okay? So if you take this, this is something they had to do. And they did this all the way up until about the last eight or nine years of Saul's kingship. And then they stopped, okay? They went 490 years not doing this. Seventy times they did not let the land lay fallow. Seventy, you're going to find out, is judgment. And what happened when that thing hit 70? Nebuchadnezzar shows up. And they go up there for how many years? Seventy. Judgment. Then they're given another 490. Daniel gets that thing on the 490 years. And so when Peter says, uh, how many times do we forgive? Seven? Jesus says seven times 70 because he's forgiven them twice that. Okay? All right. This represents Jesus' second coming after 6,000 years and taking the righteous to heaven. The wicked would be destroyed at his coming, coming, leaving the earth empty, laying fallow for 1,000 years. Okay? You follow that? The sixth year, they're supposed to let the earth lay fallow for one year or 1,000 years. Fallow means lay at rest. It's not doing anything. They don't work the ground. Anything that grows goes to the poor. Okay? Exodus uh, 21 2. Now, you'll notice these are all different places in the Bible. It says that the Hebrew slave was to serve six years and be released the seventh year. And again, here we have this man is a slave to sin. He is released from slavery after six years or 6,000 years, and then he is set free the second coming of Jesus. Okay, so all these things that they were showed to do all have something has to do with our time that we can put things together with. Here's another one, Exodus. Uh, now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. Now I don't know if you knew this or not. What day did they leave Egypt? What festival? Passover. Passover okay, 14th day of the first month. Uh, they had, what kind of bread did they have? Unleavened bread, right? So that when they put the blood on the doorpost, uh, it's representing Christ's blood, and Christ's blood forgives sin. And leaven or yeast is sin, and these guys have no bread with them, and so they're doing the Passover. The next day is Festival of Unleavened Bread, okay? Now, I haven't figured out the next day of the first fruits because they were already on their way. I'm assuming they were all first fruits in this illustration that we're getting, right? Uh, 50 days from first fruits is Pentecost. He's up on the mountain, okay? So to kind of give you an idea of how that's playing out when they come out of Egypt. So this says, now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. On the seventh day, he, Jesus, called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So here you have this picture of Moses. After six days, he is called up the mountain. And so Moses goes up into the clouds. So it's a little picture of this 
week of time again. Kings, he said to his servant, go now and look toward the sea. You know where we are? We're with Elijah, and he's up on top of Mount Carmel. He has prayed uh, earnestly, and there's been no rain for three years. Okay, and he's just won this victory. 400 priests of Baal have been killed. And now it just doesn't start raining just because of all that. Okay, he has to pray again for the rain to start. So he starts praying and he sends his servant, go now look over at the sea. So he went and he looked. He said, there is nothing. Seven times. Elijah said, go back. And it came to pass after six times, on the seventh, the servant reported there is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising up out of the sea. What is that a sign of? Second coming of Christ. So it's clear there more so than any of the other ones maybe. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus Christ is making this statement to people. Every one of those people died before the second coming of Christ. So what's he saying? This is Matthew 16, 28. The next verse, Matthew 17, 1, says this. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain. And what happened? Mount of Transfiguration. What do we have? We have God's there, Jesus there, Moses representing those who have died and gone to heaven, and Elijah representing those who don't die at all and go to heaven. You have a mini picture of the second coming. Miriam and Aaron, if you heard the sermon I did, you've heard this already, but Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they ask? Has he also spoken through us? And the main culprit on this is Miriam. And the Lord heard this. At once the Lord said, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out. Makes you wonder what they felt like as to how that was going to happen. You know, okay, here we go. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance of the tent. He's on the ground. Okay, he's going to meet with them personally. And he summons Aaron and Miriam. I wonder if they're beginning to think, I wonder what this is about. When both of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. Why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Well, they were wondering. They, this comes to mind now very quickly. The, angel, the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, there stood Miriam, leprous, leprous like snow. What is that? It's, it's a death decree. Okay? She speaks against God's servant, and she gets a death decree. Right? All right. Aaron, who is speaking against Moses also, runs to Moses to intercede for Miriam. You talk about a meek man. I bet he knew some of this, don't you think? So Moses cried out to the Lord, Oh God, please heal her. <clears throat> the Lord replied to Moses, and I have never figured this part out yet, if her father had spit in her face would she not have been in disgrace for seven days? I don't know anything in the Bible that refers to that. But there must have been something in the day that that was something everybody knew. Confine her outside the camp for seven days after she can be brought back from death decree to seven days. And why is she confined outside the camp? Why is that? She's unclean? Okay. Okay. She's being punished, all right. Huh? It's what? Could be, yeah, it could be. You're not protected. Here's a biggie. The Lord's living in the camp. And she's separated from him. And so a human being can cause God to turn what she did by uh, giving her a death decree. Yeah, yeah, that's what he did. This is merciful, huge mercy, right? Because why? Because Moses intercedes. Right? So intercede for your kids. Intercede for your family. Intercede for your coworkers. Okay? All right. Here's a parallel story. Uh, who is, and I did this before, you probably all know the answer to it, but who is the one woman, if you're going to talk about a woman mentioned in the Bible that you think most the public would just pick right up on? 
Who? Esther. Esther? Mary? Mary Magdalene. Who? Who'd you, who'd you? Jezebel. <laughs> well, they must because they don't name their kids that anymore. <laughs> this person's name comes up most often. Eve. Okay? Of course, they're generally making fun of the story. Almost every time her name is mentioned in the Bible, it is connected with the fall of man. Almost every time. She's mentioned four times. Okay? You'll find out that four in the Bible is God's appointed time. That's what it means. Okay? Why was this God's appointed time? People sinning was God's appointed time? What, what is that? All right. Let's look at the story. We know the story, but let's look at it again. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil what she wanted to be like. She wants to be like God. She eats it. Without fear, Ellen White says, she plucked and ate, and now having herself transgressed, she became the agent of Satan, working the ruin of her husband in a strange, unnatural excitement. She sought his presence. She's become an agent. Okay. What was the penalty for eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Death. Death. Right? For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Christ would reach to the depths of misery to rescue the ruined race. One of the worst times in the history of mankind, he shows up. Before the Father, he pleaded in the sinner's behalf while the host of heaven awaited the results with the intense, intensity of interest. To Adam, the offering of the first sacrifice was the most painful ceremony. His hand must be raised to take the life which only God could give. It was the first time he'd ever witnessed death. Anybody else in the universe ever witnessed death? Not that we know of. This is new to everybody. As he slew the innocent victim, he trembled at the thought that his sin must shed the blood of the spotless Lamb of God. The substitution of the Lamb of God changed Eve and Adam's penalty from death to being removed from God's presence for how long? How long were they going to be removed from God's presence? We weren't told. We weren't told. Let's look at a comparison. Here's Miriam, and here's all her stuff here. Here's Eve uh, and mankind. Miriam wanted to be like the leader Moses. Eve wanted to be like God, like Jesus. Mary was not afraid to talk bad about Moses. Eve was not afraid to take the fruit and eat it. Was, uh, Miriam was given a death decree. Eve was given a death decree. Moses interceded. Jesus interceded. Miriam was given seven days to be in disgrace outside the camp of God and his people. And what we're learning, ladies and gentlemen, is, is there are seven, seven symbolic days to be in disgrace outside the presence of God and unfallen inhabitants, which would be 7,000 years. Do you see the connection? Okay. All right. This one, I had forgotten this story. And I don't think many of you will remember it until we get right into the middle of it. Um, this lady was not a very nice lady at all. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaz Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, Ahaziah was the king. So she's the king's mother. And I just found out today, being a little slow, that uh, remember the, when they called on Elijah and 50 guys and a captain went out and he burned them up? You remember that story? And then, then they sent another 50 guys and a captain, and he burned those guys up. Elijah did that to these people. It was this king that was trying to get him and arrest him and bring him to the, bring him to the uh, city. Okay? So he's distraught. He's, uh, he's dead. She arose, and she destroyed all the royal heirs. Who would that be? Let's see, her kids and her grandkids. Really? You ever met anybody that ugly? Most of the time they're going, look at my child, isn't he beautiful? He looks just like me, right? 
But Jehoshaba, the daughter of King Joram, he happened to be uh, the king prior. Okay? She is a daughter, she's a sister of Ahaz, I can't say these words tonight, Ahaziah, who had just died. She took Joash, who is the king's son. Now you know the story? All right? <clears throat> the son of Ahaziah, and she stole him away and hid him and his nurse. This is a 7,000-year theory by Doug Bachelor, uh, page 5. It's an interesting story. It talks about this wicked king, who, queen, who ruled over God's people for six years. Huh. And the promised child, the true king, was hidden in the temple of the Lord. He was preserved. So Athaliah ruled for six years as she was slain. Now, when I read it, it's hard to tell. You don't know what the Jews would do, but on Sabbath morning, Joash comes out as king. They either killed her on Friday, or they killed her on this, the evening, which would be Sabbath, because the evenings came first. So I'm trying to figure out which one it is. Uh, but if they killed her on Friday, it happens to be the sixth day also. Then on Sabbath, at the beginning of the seventh year, Joash came out of the temple and was made king. Jesus is in the temple in heaven and will come out at the end of the 6,000 years and Babylon, the mother of harlots, will be destroyed and we will spend the Sabbath millennium with Jesus. Parallels are really good on that story, isn't it? It's amazing. Now I'll give you some history about the week of time. Okay, the L. E. Froome was one of our guys, and he wrote these books called Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, and what he's doing is, there's several volumes, what he's doing is he's taking prophecy, and he's going back, as far back as he can go and get information as to what did they think this prophecy meant in 1549, okay? And so, take the example of, of Daniel. Daniel sealed up. So, what did they think Daniel said? in 200 B.C.? What do they think he said in 580? What do you think it said? And, and you can get a development of how they understood these prophecies down through time as history would unfold. Okay, so that's what he's doing here. The early Jewish idea, uh, he gets this 200 years, my understanding is 200 years before Christ, was that the world will last 6,000 years and be in chaos during the 7,000th year. Okay, this is the Jewish idea. So this will become very clear that this is not a Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. We did not think up this week of time thing, All right? Uh, Ed Reed's book, Even at the Door, uh, men, who held, uh, men in the past who held this view. Irenaeus, if you know church history, you may know some of these people, but Irenaeus is a Catholic saint. Uh, Barnabas is a Jewish Christian. Uh, Cyprian is a Catholic leader. And uh, Lactanius is a uh, Christian author and advisor to the first Christian Roman emperor, which would have been Constantine. So this is way back 100, 200, 300 uh, AD. Okay? And there he is there. And these guys are just not guys that are just, you know, bums that nobody knows. Okay? You don't get stained glass of you or an artist's rendition of you being nobody. Okay? So these are the leaders for that time period who believe this concept. Here's some more, as well as known scholars like Mead, a scholar from Cambridge in the 1600s, Clark, a British Methodist biblical scholar in the 1700s, uh, Gibbon, a member of parliament who wrote The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, and even Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, believed in the week of time. So now we've gone down through Jews, Catholics, Protestants, okay? It continues. Others believe this concept included Martin Luther, William Miller, J.N. Andrews, S. S. Haskell, J.N. Loughborough, James, and Ellen White, and a bunch more. Okay? So you get the idea how it comes down through most all of our forefathers bought into this idea that we haven't heard for 20 some odd years now in the church. Why is that? So the history of the week of time here is somebody asked J.N. Andrews to go through the Bible 
and give a report in the Adventist Review, which is a church paper, the official church paper, and tell everybody whether this concept is legitimate or not. Is this a biblical concept okay, that you can have faith in and it's real? Why did they ask Jay and Andrews? Well, he had the entire New Testament memorized. And if you were to sit down and write it out, he could then write it in Hebrew, and he could then write it in Greek, and he could then write it in Latin. J. and Andrews, Andrews University is named after him. He was the first missionary of Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yeah. So he was asked to do this. Why? The guy knows lots and lots of stuff. So J. and Andrews writes six articles in the Review and Herald titled The Great Week of Time started in July 17, 1883, and concluded uh, six weeks later, August 21, 1883. So there are six articles. In it, he says, it appears that God designed by the first seven days of time to indicate the period assigned to, probation, to the probation and judgment of mankind. We think, therefore, that at the end of 6,000 years from creation, the day of judgment will commence and that day will last for a period of a thousand years. So this guy's conclusion in our church paper was this. Okay? The Lord comes after 6,000 years. We go to heaven on the 7,000th year, the week of time. Ellen White. What does she think? Okay, now I have these wonderful little articles here that I hated as I studied all this stuff for years and years and years. This one is called, How Accurate is Bible Chronology? And this one is Ellen G. White and Bible Chronology. And this is in the Ministry Magazine. And they basically said that when Ellen White says 6,000 years to some event, you could just say uh, th thousands of years. Be the same thing. Drove me mad. It's in a ministry mix. <laughs> but uh, w the other thing they said was, remember when the uh, discs, the CDs came out on Ellen White? They had all the writings, you know, of Ellen White on these discs, about 1980s, 85, somewhere in there. <laughs> uh, it was the first time we could put everything together that she said and really chase down topics. They had things that where people had done it by hand. But this you could do. You could take it home and you could do it. And so this, these articles in here state that she says uh, 42 times that the Lord comes at 6,000 years. 42 times. The prophet for this church says that. 41 times she says 4,000 years between creation, the fall, and uh, basically near the, the crucifixion of Christ. Okay? So... That's what she thinks. We're going to give you six of them so you can look at it. See how it goes. The great plan of redemption results in fully bringing back the world into God's favor. All that was lost by sin is restored. Not only man, but the earth is redeemed to be the eternal abode of the obedient. For 6,000 years, Satan has struggled to maintain possession of this earth. Now God's original purpose in creation is accomplished. You'll notice that when she's close to events with the second coming, she says for 6,000 years, when she's talking about events just before the second coming, she will say for nearly. <clears throat> the great controversy between Christ and Satan that's been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years is soon to close, and the wicked one redoubles his effort to defeat the work of Christ in man's behalf and to fasten souls in his snare. The spirits deny the deity of Christ and place them place even the creator on a level with themselves. Thus, under a new disguise, the great rebel still carries on his warfare against God, begun in heaven and for nearly 6,000 years continued upon the earth. For 6,000 years, the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and his heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. Now all have made their decisions and the wicked have fully united with Satan and his warfare against God. For 6,000 years, Satan's work of rebellion has made the earth to tremble. For 6,000 years, his prison house, which is death, 
has received God's people and he would have held them captive forever, but Christ has broken his bond and set the prisoners free. Satan's work of ruin is forever ended. For 6,000 years, he wrought his will, filling the earth with woe and causing grief throughout the universe. Do you think she thought that the end of time, or the second coming, was 6,000 years? Do you think that? Do you think you could just say, oh, no, just put thousands in there, right? All right. So it's clear that we have a, a prophet in this church that believed this, okay? All right. Now, here's one of the critics, uh, some of the critics on this thing, Ellen White and Usher's chronology. One of the reasons why people say she thought this, uh, the 6,000 years was, was about over, was because of the dating in the King James Bible. It was developed by Archbishop James Usher in 1650. So he comes up with a, a chronology of how old the earth is, and he's using everything he can get his hands on, uh, from history and from what we can grab now. And then he's going through all the material in the scripture because there's dates in there to certain events and he's putting this thing together. And it's actually not bad. This is one of the best chronologies that were done. Even as they went on through time, uh, this one held up pretty good. And so they took his uh, chronologies and it, uh, they were put into the Bible in the early 1700s and was there until 1900 and 1910. Okay, when did Ellen White die? 1915. Those dates he had were in her Bible until five years before she died. Okay? So they say, well, that's why, that's why she thinks that. All right? Well, there are two places that uh, James Usher, as, as they came to find out, and we'll go into a little bit of detail, but there are two places where he uh, blew it. One was the kings of Judah. And the kings of Judah, we didn't get that right. Nobody got that right until 1977. That's pretty recent, isn't it? Okay, so that chronology helped pretty good. The other thing where he blew it, and you may disagree with this, but think it through a little bit, was he used the Bible genealogies. Now, why would that be a problem? Well, the dad is not born on the same day as his son. And so they could be off almost a whole year. Okay? There are 20 guys between uh, Adam and Abraham. Right? So... If you were to take my wonderful statistics class that I hated that I took at undergraduate and graduate level, <laughs> uh, if you were to take 200 people and have that big of a group and then just randomly said, oh, this guy's born this time, this guy was born this time, and just randomly went through it, you'd be off about a half a year on each one. Okay? So if we take that information, apply it to 20 guys, it's 10 years off. Okay, now this is just a guess. You can't sit down and say that's absolutely certain. But statistically, he's 10 years off this direction. The kings of Judah, he was 10 years off this direction. Uh, he was 49 years off this direction. So you've got 30, uh, 41 years. Did I say 41 or 49? 41. So he's 31 years off, all right, that from what you can go through and try to figure, which isn't bad. 6,000 years, he's only... 31 years off. At the, at the time when they stopped using his stuff, they discovered things like the Rosetta Stone, which gave them the ability to read hieroglyphics and Egyptian cuneiform. So they found these obliques that kind of looked like the, the uh, Washington Monument. And it had two languages on there of a story on two different sides. And then they had hieroglyphics and Egyptian cuneiform on the other two. And we couldn't read them. But when they found this, we can now read them, and we could run Egyptian cuneiform and Egypt, Egyptian hieroglyphics through his stuff, and that's how they started finding out that the kings of Judah were off. Okay. <clears throat> In doing this, they discovered his heirs, the dating of the kings of Judah, and the heirs of the genealogy from Adam to Abraham. Now, his book is only 1,400 pages long. I didn't read it. I started to get it, and I thought, this is great, and then I found this. And I know you can't read it, but right, well, I can't even do that. But the pink ones going up are Adam to Noah, 
and then the blue ones coming down are uh, Noah's son Shem, down to Abraham, and then uh, then say so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph coming down there, and that's Genesis, a big blue line there. The kings of Judah are the big white uh, rectangle up there by the yellow one. Anyway, that's everything down to Christ that he did. Okay, that's out of his book, all put onto one thing so you can look at it. Usher's chronology has stated that the creation was started in 4004 BC, and some of the material I read, it was October 23, was Sunday of creation. Okay? If that was true, the end of the 6,000 years would have been 1997. Right? Here's another guy. You know who this guy is by his picture? Sir Isaac Newton. He had a chronology. The guy with, uh, he invented gravity. <laughs> no, he didn't. He observed it, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> What's that? He created the light tube. No, well, no, no, that was, uh, who is that? Edison, right? Didn't Edison? Why he created that beam. Sir Isaac Newton created the beam. Well, yeah, he could, well, you know more than I do. I, I don't know that. Okay. All right. So he does a chronology. He's a brilliant guy. He does a chronology. He had the creation date at 4,000. He's off 4,000 years different from uh, uh, Usher's. So Newton's chronology, if it had been correct, the end would have uh, been 2001. Let me show you something. Um, this is, uh, I can't read it. That's what he's on. I can't read the thing. Oh, look, there's people still out there. Okay. Okay, this is the U.S. News and World Report. Ralph Reed. The big fight in Republican presidential politics now is over who will win his services. Who is Ralph Reed? Christian Coalition, right-hand right -hand guy. Okay. This is January 5, 1998. So the Christian Coalition is taking over the Republican Party. Uh, who is this? Uh, it's just either U.S. News or World Report or Time. I don't remember which one it is. Where's the party going? Dole, Ralph Reed, Pat Robertson. Okay, moral majority. Remember those people? All right. Here's an interesting quote. This is one of our magazines. Uh, who said this? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. Jesus said that. All right, here's another quote. We have enough boats to run this country, and when people say we've had enough, we're going to take over. Pat Robertson. Does it sound like somebody following Christ? Uh, well, <clears throat> how about Time Magazine? 1995, the right hand of God. Ralph Reed again. Meet Ralph Reed, 33. His Christian coalition is on a crusade to take over U.S. politics, and it's working. U.S. News, World Report. I don't see the time on this, but it's in that same era. Honor thy father. U.S. News and World Report. For God's sake, religious conservatives think their time has come. U.S. News and World Report. The rise of Christian capitalists. All this is happening in the late 80s and 1990s as we're coming toward the 2,000 years and everybody's looking at it the end of the 6,000 years, right? Uh, Christian coalition lost all their power because of a man named Clinton. Remember him? Yeah. And Monica Lewinsky in What Is Is. Okay? They were trying to get him out of there. Christian coalition was going to throw him out. And everybody was making so much money, they didn't want him thrown out. Okay, so the more majority you'll find right there, that's when their politics went poof, into, the, into, the, into the tub there. See if I have anything else here they want to show right now. But anyway, this is it was a huge thing. Oh, here's Life Magazine, John Paul's Journey. He's in everything. The Pope in the Holy Land, time again. Uh, we were seeing Christianity coming to a forefront and taking over, over uh, politics in this country. That was happening. So people were really excited about the whole thing. And then, of course, nothing happened. So is the week of time a wrong concept? 
It was 20 years ago, folks. Is there any way it can still be viable today? You had all these theologians, all from the Jews, all the way down, the top people, folks, our own prophet, believe this. It didn't happen. So that was my question when I started looking at this thing. We're, why did this go away? Uh, it, it, everything fit. It fits. Look at all the stories, all the places throughout the scripture. It all is all there. What happened? <clears throat> We're going to get into numbers. Okay? Because in numbers, it's very interesting what you can learn from numbers. Did you ever notice when reading the Bible, the book had a lot of numbers in it? I had a member, of course, like I told you, he thought I had too many numbers in my sermons. They were all quotes out of the Bible. As you probably know, there's an entire book in the Bible called Numbers. And how many of you have read Numbers recently? Isn't it a favorite book? You just want to read that all the time, don't you? Yeah, well, <clears throat> this is an interesting thing. And I just put this in. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I thought this was interesting. God trade, God's trade for the firstborn of Israel for the tribe of, of the Levites. Remember this? Because at Passover, he got all the firstborn. Right, because he saved them. And then the golden calf, the Levites didn't participate. So he won the Levites, so he trades. Now you think the number of the Levites would be the same number of the people, the rest of the people? You know, what, what is that about? So God's claim, the firstborn had passed over, and he traded them after the golden calf incident. Total number of Levites, 22,000. How many people do you think there were that he's trading? The total number of the firstborn, okay, firstborn in Israel. 22,273, all right? So who gets the short end of the stick here? Somebody's losing 273 people, all right? 273 extra firstborn uh, had to be purchased by Israel to complete the trade because God was short the 273. They paid, uh, they did six, and now that left me, what do they call their money back? Shekels, six shekels for each individual to get the trade to work out. Okay. Here's more numbers. The hairs of your head are numbered. No, Jody likes that picture really well. That's her. She and her girlfriend. <clears throat> the saints were numbered and sealed. The number of the names of the saints included in the book from life, from the creation to the world. Here's some 1260, 1290, 1335, 2300, all out of Daniel, seven weeks, 62 weeks, one week out of Daniel, seven times. Times, times, and a half a time, 1,262 years, 42 months, three and a half years, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. And here's all the numbers in the Bible in one reference I went to that mean things. Okay? If you want to do it, get on your phone or computer and put in uh, meanings of biblical numbers. And you'll get something that pops up here. We had, uh, I forgot her name, uh, she didn't know her name. She was handing out something recently to all of us here in the church that had to do with numbers. And, and uh, many of them are, you know, most of them are all pretty much the same. There's some differences. All right. Number three means harmony or wholeness. And, of course, we always think of, of God, three in one. Three beasts in Revelation, seven heads and ten horns. That doesn't sound like harmony and wholeness, but it's the ministry of Satan, what he is, the three phases of his work, particularly from the day when John was alive in Rome to the end. I will send you such a blessing in the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three years, harmony and wholeness. They had to rest on the Sabbath day. Three times the angel threatened Balaam. Three times he beat his donkey. Three times Balaam blessed Israel. Well, it didn't sound too good until it got to the blessing part of the whole thing, right? Uh, but and, and interesting, it was three times that each of those three times happened. Moses wanted to take Israel into the desert for three days of worship. Egypt covered in darkness for three days. After the Red Sea opened, they found no water for three days. Three times each year, all the men were to appear before the Lord in Jerusalem. We all know about seven, the perfect number, seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven spirits, seven earthquakes, seven thunders, seven vials, seven angels, seven mountains, seven heads, seven crowns, seven horns, seven eyes, and the seventh day. Ten. Uh, one thing that, you, that they, they tell you in this is that if you times any number by ten, it's complete. So uh, you'll see some stuff like that also. But we have the Ten Commandments, the Ten Plagues, Ten Lepers, Ten Horns, Ten Kings, Ten Virgins. The woman had ten coins and loses one. Now the 40 is huge. If you've ever looked at 40s, this is God's appointed 
testing time. And you'll see that some of these don't fit that, but a lot of them do. The flood, uh, 40 days and 40 nights of rain. Isaac aged when he married Rebecca. That was one of the things that didn't fit, unless they didn't get along right from the beginning, which they didn't get along at the end. So maybe it was a testing time. I, I don't know. Moses visits his people at age 40. After 40 years as a shepherd, Moses sees a burning bush. Days Moses was on the mountain twice. Days they spied in the promised land. Joshua was 40 when he was a spy. Israel's uh, uh, years, they wandered in the wilderness. Eli led Israel for 40 years. During Gideon's life, the land had peace for 40 years. Punishment by judge not to exceed 40 lashes. Saul's age when he became king. Goliath came forward every morning and evening for 40 days. Saul, David, Solomon, and Joash reigned for 40 years as kings. Israel captured by the Philistines for 40 years. The temple, 40 cubits long. Elijah ran from Jezebel for 40 days and 40 nights. Days of embalming someone. Egypt desolate for 40 years. 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Days Jesus was in the wilderness. Christ appeared to the people for 40 days after the resurrection. God's name connected with the 2300 years. You may find this interesting, okay? What's the date that we all know of is, is uh, Daniel 8, 14, unto 2300 days, then will the sanctuary be cleansed. Well, we don't know very well the verse right ahead of that, Daniel 8, 13. Then I heard one saint speaking to the other to another saint, saint said unto that certain saint, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice? That certain saint is referencing Christ. This chapter is written in Aramaic. That certain saint, if you go to the margin, anybody with a King James Bible, I don't care if it's new or not, or old, you go to the margin, it says Palamoni. That certain saint referencing Christ Jesus. In the margin of the King James Bible, the Cambridge University Press, the woman and the beast of Revelation, which is written by Wurr, who is a, a pastor, Adventist pastor in Australia, page 102 and Wikipedia all said this. The palimony could also be interpreted as the number of secrets, the wonderful number referencing Jesus Christ. Interesting. The Woman and the Beast, the book of Revelation by Wurr. In his book, he says, the almighty architect of the universe is, is there, that was a chapter, is there anything in his vast creation that was created without reference to number? Psalms is given there. He determines the number of the stars. He calls them each by their name. Isaiah, lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth their host out by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might. Uh, from the mighty orbs that act as luminous hands in the heavenly chronometer, moving with faultless precision, according to the mathematical determined speed across a vaulted dome, to the minutia on this planet, all things are governed by mathematical law. We know that the times for the rising of the setting of the sun, moon, and stars, the ebb and flow of tides, seasons coming and going, and the whole course of nature, whether of animal or plant life, are governed by definite mathematical laws. As never before, man now sees that everything in nature is controlled by mathematical laws and principle. Sounds like it was written a few years ago. How about 1955? Sir James Jean, in his book, The Mysterious Universe, in delving into the deeper things of science, says a scientific study of the actions of the universe has suggested a conclusion which may be summed up in this statement. The, the universe appears to have been designed by a pure mathematician. Isn't that interesting stuff? As everything in nature bears the imprint of carefully used numbers, and as the Bible has been inspired by God, it is, not, is it not reasonable to believe that in the scriptures also will be found numbers that the all-wise creator has employed in order that we might obtain a true understanding of his will expressed therein. It would be a rare thing indeed if God's word, which the psalmist declared is magnified above all God's name, bears no mathematical manifestations when everything else of his creation bears that indispensable imprint. Number six, 
represents man's rebellion and false religion. And number six is shown to be a brand that the Lord has placed upon the things of Babylon. The word Babylon is found six times in the book of Revelation. These are the beginnings of the followers of Satan who rebelled against God, is camouflaged by religious services, a false religious system, a worship whose number is six, who murder those who follow God. Cain's genealogy has six names in it. Cain, Enoch, Erod, Mahujael, Methusael, and Lamech. And I'll just tell you the genealogy of Adam has eight. It starts and ends with murderers. We all know this one, right? Uh, the false woman, Babylon, the mother of harlots is mentioned. Well, no, not this, the next one. It is mentioned six times in Revelation 17. You want to take a guess how many times the pure woman is mentioned? Eight times. There's the text. This calls for more wisdom. The number of the beast is the number of his man. His number is 666. In the past, most Protestants were aware of the Pope's title, Vicarious Fili Dea, Vicar of the Son of God. If you take the Latin numbers, so you just take Vicarious Fili Dea because the Latin numbers are in letters, okay? And you just take those letters and it comes out to 666. The beast of Revelation 13.3 receives a deadly wound. The deadly wound was healed. The beast numbered 666 dies and then is resurrected. Does that sound like someone else you know? who died and is resurrected. Jesus' number, the number that symbolizes the Lord's resurrection and triumph over his enemies, is the number eight. This fact is well known to those who give consideration to the numeric system, which is clearly revealed in the Bible. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. While God waited patiently, in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism. So if you go down in the water, you come back up in what? New life in Christ. And so we have eight people who go through the baptism of the flood. All right? Uh, Christ's resurrection is connected to the number eight. Christ last week before the cross to Pentecost is eight weeks. The fifth day he is betrayed, the sixth day he is crucified, the seventh day he rests in the tomb, the eighth day he was resurrected. Eight different writers wrote about the resurrection of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, Peter, and Jude. The church believes in the resurrection power and its members experience it. It is symbolized by a pure woman in Revelation 12. The pure woman is mentioned eight times, and there they are. John says there is a new life in the Son of God. The Son of God is mentioned eight times in the book of John. The only way a man could obtain new life is, is by God becoming the Son of Man. The Son of Man is mentioned in the New Testament 88 times. David is considered a type of Jesus. Which son was he? He was the eighth son of Jesse. Solomon was considered a type of Jesus. He's the eighth son of David. According to Peter, how many steps are there into the kingdom? Faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. Eight of them. Colossians 1, 16 to 20, there are eight things mentioned in the new kingdom. Thrones, powers, authorities, rulers, his head, he said, the body, the church, and the beginning. Did you know there's this many of these things? The sign of the creator and redeemer is the Sabbath mentioned eight times in the book of Acts. There they are. In the book of Hebrews, Paul refers to an eternal rest in the new heavens and the new earth and the new life. The Greek word is kataposis. Paul uses that term eight times. In the book of Hebrews, there are eight better things, things that accompany salvation, hope, the covenant, promises, uh, sacrifice, substance, country, and the eighth one is resurrection. Elijah performed eight miracles. 1 Kings 17, 1, no rain. 1 Kings 17, 14, 16, food for the widow. 1 Kings, raising the widow. Sun, causing fire from heaven. Rain from heaven. 
Twice fire comes down from heaven and burns up the captain of 50 men, dividing the Jordan River. There's his aid. Now, I'll tell you a story. Do you know what Elisha, who was picked by Elijah, what did he ask for? Just when he find out that Elijah's leaving, what's he asked for? You know? Double portion. Elijah has eight miracles. How many do you suppose Elisha had? Sixteen. Sixteen. Do you know what his last miracle was? Eight is what? New life in Christ. What's his last miracle? Huh? Yeah, yeah, it is. And let me tell the story, because most of them don't remember it, okay? Here's the story, okay? Remember Naaman and a little girl? The, the Assyrians are coming into Israel, and they're, they're, they're taking people. They're killing parents. They're taking the kids. They're making slaves. There's a funeral going on. And they're all out there with their funeral, and they got the deceased there, and they're going along, and somebody, they're watching, right, because this is going on. And somebody sees Assyrians. Well, the funeral's over. You know, people are running, and they take the body, and I don't know if it's a cave. It's better if it's a sepulcher, you know, with a floor, where they just go, <laughs> okay, they just throw him in there. And he hits the body of Elisha, and a guy comes to life. That's the 16th miracle, two eights, okay? Now, wouldn't you think that somebody who shows up with the spirit and power of Elijah, who is that? It shows up the spirit and power of Elijah. John the Baptist. Okay? How many miracles did John the Baptist do? Zero. When I was working on this, this is what got me into all this mess, see? And what's John the Baptist doing? He is pointing to Jesus Christ. Right? So he's pointing at Jesus. He's making the way straight. He's, it's all about Jesus. Eight miracles of Jesus in the book of John. Huh. Water turned to wine. No one's son healed. An impotent man healed. Beating of the multitude. Walking on the water. Blind man healed. Lazarus raised. Miraculous catching of 153 fish. Do you ever wonder why they didn't count fish the first time when he about sank two boats? Why'd they count that? So there are eight miracles of Jesus and there are eight miracles of Elijah. Feeding the multitude, walking on the water, Lazarus raised. Here they are. These are Jesus' miracles right there. Okay? Here's Elijah's. You feed the multitude, you fed the widow. Now you've got to be a little creative here. Okay, walking on the water, dividing the Jordan River, had to do with water. Lazarus raised, widow's son raised. Water turned to wine, so we're going off the water again. No rain, then rain. Okay, so how many do we have here? We have eight on Jesus' side. We got one, two, three, four, five, okay? Fire from heaven. We think of fire from heaven as a miracle, right? And so I lined that one up with the three, three guys who were healed. Okay, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six. <clears throat> yeah, we'll go on here. Three times King Hazaya sent a captain and 50 men to capture Elijah. Three times. <clears throat> to stop his work, he was a fisherman of men as well. He brought in lots of people on Mount Carmel that day. King Hazaya sent a total of 153 Men. Twice, two groups of them are wiped out. That gets you up to the eight on each side, right? <clears throat> Three groups of men are... are so, so what's going on here? Uh, Jesus, on that time period, he goes out to the... He's already resurrected. He's looking for the disciples. What did Peter do? Peter says, let's go fishing. What are they supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be fishing for men, right? So we know that uh, John and James are out there with them. They were partners. So we know they were there. There was a couple of the guys uh, that they named. I forgot who they were. But there were two more people that they don't name. And I think, I think that, uh, that Matthew was one of those guys because Matthew is a tax collector. 
and Matthew counts stuff. Okay? So I think he was out there that day. I don't know if he was or not, but he's out there, I think. So you got two of the guys that write the gospel story. <clears throat> Jesus tells him to put the, the net in there, and this 153 fish come up. They're supposed to be fishing for men, right? On the other side, you have 153 men. How many men are lost? How many men are saved? You have two groups that are burned up. The third group comes, man, the captain is on his knees. He's begging for his life and his men. He says, please respect the men, please. And so the angel tells uh, Elijah to go with him. Made me always wonder if the angel was telling him to destroy everybody, the others. But what's interesting is that one-third is saved and two-thirds are lost, right? Does that remind you of anything? How about two-thirds are saved and one-third is lost? Exact opposite in heaven, right? Well, oh, I should I, let me get in my, ahead of myself. Now, if you think that's really cool about those two things matching up, when I found this on the Internet, I didn't believe it at all. So I went and I made a matrix, and I did Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and I went through it, and I have my Bible. This is the Bible I had at the time. And this Bible right here has harmony of the Gospels. And you can see that anything that happened in the Gospels, you can see whether Matthew recorded it, Mark recorded it, Luke recorded it, or John recorded it, or if they all did. Okay? So I drew out my metrics on my computer, and I'm following this to make sure that I get everything. So I did this. There it is. Gave the Bible text, Mary, Joseph, John the Baptist, the father of Zebedee, 12 disciples, man with leprosy, a centurion of the servant, Peter's mother-in-law, two men of Gadarenes, paraplytic, Jesus, uh, Jairus and his daughter, the women, everybody that Jesus impacted positively. Okay? There they all are. Now we go to Mark, and we go to Luke, and we go to John. 47 people he blessed in Matthew. Three people in Mark that weren't already mentioned in Matthew. 94 people in Luke. Nine people in John. Grand total, Jesus blessed, 153 people. He's our example. Right? He's telling them, don't go fish for fish. Fish for man, like I did. Two of the writers are in a boat. John said, if we'd written down everything, we'd have filled up the whole earth full of books. But they only wrote down what the Holy Spirit told them to write down, and it hit 153 people. Fascinating? Amazing to me. Now, here's a, a little part we've got to shut down here. Uh, Satan, this is Ellen White now, Satan has an accurate knowledge of the sins that he tempted God's people to commit. He urges his accusation against them, declaring that by their sins they have forfeited divine protection and claiming that he has the right to destroy them. He pronounces them just as deserving as himself of exclusion from the favor of God. Are these, he says, the people who are to take my place in heaven and the place of the angels who united with me? Is it possible, when we look at all these stories, that the three-thirds on the Elijah story, we have two-thirds on this earth that are lost and one-third that are saved to replace the one-third that was lost there? Is that possible? Interesting, isn't it? 875 years after Elijah, Jesus gathers or creates 153 fish to help remind the disciples that they should be fishers of men, not fishermen. Jesus knew that over 2,000 years later, people would find the connection in the scripture between the 153 soldiers and 153 fish and 153 people who Jesus blessed. And we would be reminded that we are to be fishers of men and are to continue to find and save the last of the lost sons of God, and replace the one-third that the angels, of the angels that were lost. I 
I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Where are we? We are in the United States. We are rich. We have need of nothing. We are lukewarm. When I was in this conference, I took numbers I got from the general conference, and they're not all together. I took baptisms, professions of faith, deaths, and apostasies of the annual reports we would get. And I would get a number, and I'd divide them by how many churches we have in the United States. And if we get three baptisms per year of churches in the United States, and we're not make it, trying to de, de, uh, say it's not important but most of the work in the United States is done by the Spanish people and we took the stats here and did percentages because we couldn't get stats from, from uh, uh, North America and if you take those same percentages we're down to one baptism per church per year for everybody other than the Spanish and if you baptize if you, I mean if you knock off baptizing your own children there's the impact we're having on the North American population. And several years ago, I got stats out of the review from the Treasurer's Report for North America, and it's still the same. We have need of nothing. We are lukewarm. We don't care. Now, I know a group of people here probably care, and there's people within the church that care. But as a whole, we don't care. And, and I can drive it home. Look at Ukraine. Those people are having a regular day when somebody decided to move in and bomb them and kill their children and their women. And we are doing nothing. And we have the ability to do something. Now, you can debate it all over the board. I, you know, I'm not here to debate any politics. I'm just telling you. There's a group of people that want to kill babies in this country, and now we're killing adults. We don't care. So one of the things that we're trying to do here is we're trying to show you that this time period is about over. We're about done. Do we care? What are we going to do about it? It is not going to come from the top down. I was at a camp meeting, I think it was in Montana, and people are all concerned, you know, when's the conference going to start so that we can, you know. And so I said, all right, you want the conference to do something? Go out in the streets and preach. Conference guy just told you to go do it. Well, nobody did it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not coming from the top down. It's going to come from the bottom up. Okay? We have to have a relationship with Christ before we'll start doing something, you know. And we're running out of time. Anyway, I should be quiet. I went 15, 20 minutes over what I was supposed to do. All right, any questions at all on what you saw tonight? Hey, you want to go home? So you do it like that, nobody has any questions. They all want to go home. Is there a certificate to a uh, Not, no, that, that I know of. I, I tried, I think I was going to work on that before I came. And um, uh, it, it's obviously not a number you can divide by two. It may be a prim primary number, is what I'm thinking it is. Uh, but I was going to do you know, 3, 7, 11, 13, and divide it in and see if it hits, hits anything. Uh, but there isn't anything that I know of off the top of my head, but I'll work on it next time. We can, we can see whether or not it, it has any meaning whatsoever. It's not one of the numbers that show up when you look at biblical numbers and what do they mean. Uh, it doesn't show up in those lists anywhere. So anyway, we've got, we got a little bit more on numbers, and then we're going to uh, get right into... Uh, uh, some of the uh, jubilees and stuff, because we've we've looked at and also, uh, and I want to just point this out before we go. When Jay and Andrews did his work, he did the same thing that a lot of people do, like in a doctorate. If you're challenging somebody's work, they have a tendency not to challenge certain things. Okay, uh, so when he said that that doctrine uh, or that concept, he called it doctrine of the week of time, he said it was from what. It was from creation to the judgment, you know, where you go to heaven, right? It'll be judgment and angels, okay? He's saying the same thing they always said, okay? When you look at numbers now, what does six represent? Evil, rebellion, uh, seduction, uh, what, they, you're, what they call it when the devil comes into you, possession. 
uh, all those things, that's what six represents. So if that's the case, and you're looking at 6,000 years, why would you go to the creation? There is none of that during the creation. Okay? And that's why it's interesting when they talk about Jesus being the wonderful number or, and that you will find the truth. Remember we read those statements? Okay, so if we then back off of the creation date and let's get to the fall date, because that's when it started. How do we get the fall date? Well, it's really, really difficult. We'll show you some of the stuff as to what we've come up with to try biblically. You do not need Usher. You do not need uh, the other gentleman who did the gravity stuff. You don't need any chronologies. Biblically, we can show you what we're looking at when we're looking at the fall date, okay? And then if you apply what we get from the fall date and go forward, where does it hit? Are we still inside that 6,000 years? And so we still have some time left. And again, Christ is not coming at the end of 6,000 years. He says he cuts the work short in righteousness. So if we get a date, it's going to be somewhere between 2022 and that date. Day or hour, I don't know. Okay, month or year, I don't know. But the righteous are going to know when he's even at the door. They're going to know it. It's the wicked that aren't going to know it. Because, and again, I've given you more than I should probably, but the la one of the final messages to the world is come out of her, my people. She protect not of her sins and receive of her plagues. And I told you this, I think, last time. The first thing I'm going to address is what plagues? And you're going to say the seven last place. When's it going to happen? Oh, I don't, I don't know. That's the end of your sermon. Okay, if you can sit down and show stuff with 6,000 years and show we're in this week and we're running out of time, then you're, we're going to get excited and start telling people, you don't want this. This is coming. And they go, how do you know that? Well, we can then do similar to what they did in 1844 where they just went right up the list. Okay? And we can show them that, that we're, we're close to this thing. Anyway. Let's have prayer. And if you have more questions, I'll, I'll hang around for a while. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for your love to us and uh, all the things that you've shown us in the, in the Bible. And uh, we just appreciate uh, your love and, and caring for us. We want everybody to be saved. And we uh, appreciate the Holy Spirit who comes and enlightens our minds and helps us to grab what's here. Continue to be with us as we head home and keep us safe and help us to have a good Sabbath. In your name we ask it, amen.